Hey everybody, welcome back to Everyman Prepping. And we're gonna get into a few news stories today, some current event things happening here, and of course talk about the wars and everything going on in other countries. First though, we're getting into that holiday season. You've got Thanksgiving next week, Black Friday deals coming up, Christmas, all that great stuff. It's a great time to pick up prepping items, not only for yourself that you might be able to get a good price on, but also for many of those people that, you know, they kind of think it's silly that you're prepping or laugh at you, but you still want to help them, their family, their friends, and you want to make sure they have a few things so they're not so bad off if something happens. Uh, one of those is water filtration, and Amazon right now, they're having a great sale on the Life Straw. They're usually about 20 bucks or so. Right now, they're I think they're at $10. I'll leave a link in the description. You can go check it out. But if you've been looking for one yourself, pick up a couple. You know, the whole thing is, you know, two is one, one is none thing. Also, great stocking stuffers for people in your family that you think might need them. Buy a couple, put them in there. And as we go through this Black Friday holiday season, as I see other deals, I'll either talk about them in videos, put them in the community section. Also, in the comments below, any video or this one, if you've seen a great deal out there to share with people, put it down below. Money's tight. Inflation's killing everybody. Let's help each other out, get some great deals, and get stocked up before we can't because China's gone crazy and attacked Taiwan and nothing else arrives on the shores anymore. Or we're hit with that EMP or who knows what's going on, but let's just all get ready. It's a good time now because we can find some deals. So check out that link if you need a life straw. But let's get on here with the video and some of the uh, news stories I want to talk about. Please also like the video, uh, share it, uh, subscribe to the channel, all that great stuff. I appreciate all that. Thank you so much for all that. But let's talk about this. It's Biden kind of doing something a little crazy, and that's not usually that unusual for him, but he's using the War Powers, War Powers Act to uh, fund electric heaters because he wants to outlaw gas appliances. You know, your stove, your furnace, your water heater, those are all killing the environment. It's not China doing mass pollution in India and all that. No, it's your natural gas, your propane uh, stove that's causing the downfall of the entire country. So keep that in mind. That's why they want to ban them all. And we need to push back against that uh, while that happens. But to let you know, he's using the War Powers Act, which is around for when there is a war. Basically, you take the uh, civilian industry infrastructure and industry and you convert it to wartime manufacturing. You know, you're producing tank parts, medical equipment, you you know, food, beans, bullets, all that stuff. That's what it's there for. Uh, last time it was used, Trump used it during COVID to make those uh, ventilators uh, from companies so we can mass produce those. And then eventually we found out that's what actually was killing everybody, but that's neither here nor there. This is basically just saying that's an abuse of the system. And what he's doing is rewarding $169 million to nine projects and nine companies in 15 sites to accelerate electric heat pump manufacturing. Something totally not needed, something to scratch someone's back, pay someone off, I don't know. But it's just an abuse of power. I thought I'd bring it to everybody's attention as to what's happening. So, you know, we're going to have to eventually rally the troops around that one. Moving on from there, in the financial kind of realm, you know, BRICS, we have a lot of wars going on. I worry about, you know, China, Russia attacking us. You know, people worried about what's going on with Israel, nukes, EMPs, all that. We can't forget the BRICS countries. They're trying to destroy the U.S. dollar and the reserve currency. Uh, you destroy that, you take the United States financial legs out, you don't have to worry about going to war because the United States is going to collapse. So that's like uh, you know, a second prong of the attack. You got the military over attacks going on and maybe what happened there, but you got financial too. And this is Sergei Lavrov, and he's talking about BRICS. He's the uh, foreign minister for Russia, and he says, uh, quote, A process has been set in motion for the world leaders to make recommendations on an alternative payment platform. There's no stopping. He said, you're not stopping us. We're doing this. This is not just limited to BRICS, you know, the 11 BRICS countries that are in there now, but also Latin America and the Caribbeans, and I would say also Africa. He, hasn't, he didn't say that, but that's what I would put in there. And so he's saying that, you know, hey, we're going to take that USR, we're going to replace it with either our own currency or our own commodity-backed currency, whether it's gold, silver, oil, lithium, whatever. And doing this, we know it'll kill the US dollar. It won't be used as reserve currency causing hyperinflation and the downward spiral. So this is still going on. It's still a thing. Do not forget about it. Keep your eyes on it. Want to bring that to, the, to your attention again. Then we have Iran. A lot of people say Iran doesn't have a bomb. They're close. A nuclear bomb. They're close. I think, my opinion, they do have it already. You know, I believe they had help from whether it be China, North Korea, Russia. I believe they already have it. Uh, I don't know how many they would have, but 
This says a UN watchdog said Wednesday that Iran's estimated stockpile of enriched uranium, which you need for a warhead, is 22 times the limit set in a 2015 accord with Tehran and world powers. Uh, so this is kind of an admission that they have a lot of nuclear material, probably just a few steps away from getting to a high enough grade where you can put it in a warhead. Like I said, I already think they have one, but if they don't, this kind of proves they're very close. And there's a lot of talk about nuclear. Uh, we're going to get into a story later about more talk about the nuclear attack coming up when we get into the uh, Israel-Gaza situation over there. Going on from that, we have this. There are ongoing attacks on U.S. forces, you know, in Syria and western Iraq. Uh, whether or not we should be there or not, you know, should we be in Syria and western Iraq? No, probably not. What are we doing there? I don't know. People say we're guarding oil, taking oil, taking out terrorists, doing this. Uh, not a video for that, but just know that, you know, we're there and not a lot of people like us there and they want us out and we probably should be out. Those soldiers should be back home where they're safe. They're not just sitting ducks out there because there's daily attacks coming from whether it be the Iraqi guard, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard, Hezbollah, whoever's, you know, firing on them, they're getting hit daily. And uh, there was an interview, this gentleman here, he's the deputy secretary of Hezbollah and he did an interview with a Spanish newspaper, it looks like El Mundo. And he said that the attack on our bases are essential to stop the mass murder of Palestinians in Gaza due to the unfettered support given by Washington to Tel Aviv. So this gentleman, you know, and his thinking is if the United States didn't support Israel, Israel would already be gone. Could be true to that. We give them plenty of weapons, money, support, all that good stuff. And he says, you know, because of what Israel is doing, we're attacking your bases. And just to have, you know, update on the most recent ones, this came a day or so ago. Here you have uh, drones. This is coming from uh, Hezbollah showing these out. There's some drones being fired, you know, how they're attacking. They also have mortar and rocket attacks going in over there. And then if you look at this one, they actually had a pretty decent strike on the base. This is the, this is the air base. I think this one's in Syria. You can see something's on fire. Is it a, something to do with the oil production? Is it a hangar? Is it planes? U.S. hasn't said, but as you can see, you know, they, they had a pretty decent strike out there, and they continue. Is the U.S. doing much? Every once in a while, they'll kick out an F-16, and they'll blow up a warehouse here or there, or, you know, a site where it was launched from, but they're not doing as much as you think they do to eradicate this, because, in my opinion, I think they want U.S. soldiers to die, so that way they can really say, we are going after Iran now. We're going hard and heavy at them. We're going to hit them hard, and this is our reasoning because you finally killed U.S. soldiers. So I think they're basically targets out there, and that's why they haven't been brought back. I've mentioned that before in other videos. But let's go on with the interview of uh, Kassam here. He goes on further to say that, well, I, I talked about Israel stands because U.S. support, and he says they have a plan. Hezbollah has a plan to force Israel to restrain itself. Not sure what that plan is, but, yeah, you know, could be hyperbola, or they could have something up their sleeve ready to do something. Kassam also added, quote, that Hezbollah today is in a much better position, and he means militarily, than in 2006 when Israel was handed a humbling defeat at the hands of the resistance. And then he says, we don't need more weapons. We have warehouses full. In fact, we need more warehouses. And that's kind of getting to the fact that Israel goes out and bombs a warehouse of ammo here and there. He says, we got plenty. We, got, we need more warehouses. You're not doing anything to us. And when he brings up that in 2006, Israel was handed to defeat, they were. They were humbled. They went into uh, southern Lebanon, tried to root out Hezbollah, and they were hit hard, and they left with the tails between their legs, basically. They, they were handed a big defeat, and they left. So uh, Hezbollah, is a, you know, it's a powerful force. And, you know, if Israel keeps, you know, poking that bear, per se, at them, uh, we're going to see a big escalation. Now... He goes on further talk of this, I mentioned nuclear talk. A lot of nuclear talk these days over there, which is a little concerning. He says, quote, If Israel uses nuclear weapons, it will kill Israelis before it kills us. This is a very small territory. He's very true about that. In any case, we are not afraid of nuclear weapons. Uh, we also heard about, you know, one of the cabinet members in Israel said they should use nuclear weapons in Gaza to destroy all the tunnels. He was relieved of his position, but it's being talked about in the government, you know, so... We should be a little concerned about that. There just seems to be too much talk about trying to use nuclear weapons in such a small area. So that's a little concerning. I want to bring that out so, you, you know, it's not a surprise to anybody. We've seen that, seen that. Let's go to the Gaza map here. 
This hasn't changed much since like two or three days ago when I did a video that Israel finally made it to the Al Shifa hospital and they went inside. We kind of saw some weapons that Israel said were in the hospital and some tunnels and then Hazmat Hamas said, you put those there, whatever happened. Since then, this blue area showing Israel hasn't really expanded much. I think they're reconsolidating after that. They're securing their current positions before they go in further. You can see the arrows where they show where they think they've advanced a little bit. We'll see, but most of Gaza City is still here. Maybe they got into a third of it, probably even less than that. A lot of work to be done there. A lot of tunnels, a lot of Hamas, so a lot more fighting. There has been bombings here in the Indonesian uh, hospital in that area. Also, the Jabalaya camp, a lot of bombings. When I say bombings, I mean Israeli aircraft dropping bombs, missiles, that kind of thing. You know, bunker busters taking out whole buildings, city blocks. A lot of that going on. Israel's taking a lot of heat from civilian casualties in that area. I think they're going to here to stay. They're going until they take this entire area. I got a feeling they might try to take this entire northern Gaza section and make it a buffer zone. We shall see. Uh, looking at another map, you know, Gaza's down here. It's not just Gaza. We got this entire West Bank area. This kind of light, bluish, purplish color. And, you know, Israel's been sending dozers and personnel in there to different you know, camps, different concentration of Palestinian uh, enclaves in there. They're tearing up the streets. They're plowing down monuments. They're, you know, then they're being hit with, you know, sniper fire. They're being hit with IEDs, blowing up the dozers. So the West Bank could explode and be another front of the war. You know, we got to watch that. Also, you can see in the north, you see this is all Hamas, uh, Hezbollah and the attacks going between those two. And then you got the Golan Heights in Syria. A lot for uh, Israel to deal with. If they all combined forces and went hard at Israel, Israel would probably be in trouble. And that's why the U.S. has the most, no, that's, you know, the largest naval concentration of naval power since probably World War II in that whole vicinity, you know, whether it be the Persian Gulf or the Mediterranean, because we'd probably have to help Israel out at that point. And it could still happen in the future. Now, moving on to a couple, this is a one-off story. It's about Australia. And we're going to kind of switch to that theater over there with China. It says that Navy divers were likely injured by the Chinese Navy's unsafe use of sonar. I don't even know what there is a safe or unsafe use. If you're a former Navy a sub, you know, a bubblehead, one of those guys, if you know anything about how sonar can damage people, I'd love to know. I just found this very curious, very interesting article. So if you have any experience in that, comment down below with how this could happen. But it says, Australia on Saturday, today, accused the Chinese Navy, Navy of likely causing minor injuries Two Australian naval divers oper while, by operating a sonar while these Australian guys were trying to clear fishing nets from the propellers. Like I said, I don't know if it's just really loud, hurts their ears, I don't know. I'd like to know if anybody has any ideas out there, but I found that very interesting. Staying on the Chinese front, I'm going to show this map here. This is from the you know, Ministry of National Defense from Taiwan, and they're talking about another incursion of Chinese planes and Navy vessels into Taiwanese industrial you know economic zone you know, basically past this black line here this is taiwan over here china this dividing line here used to keep them separated but on a daily event you got chinese planes and navy crossing that line you know either antagonizing taiwan just seeing if there's a mistake basically i think they're trying to wear them out and normalize them normalize them to these chinese incursions because then one day it's going to happen and someone might be asleep at the wheel or the radar will be down or they'll just take it as another incursion and not you know, sound the alarm. But Taiwan has to react to all these, send its planes up, its navy out, put the troops on standby, wear and tear on people, their mental, you know, their mental state, wear on the vehicles, on the machinery, all that's got to be up, kept up. You know, it's very taxing, very costly. Same on the Chinese side. They got to still deal with it on their side. One day it's going to go live. You don't do this every day just for show. You're going to actually act out it one day. And it's been in, you know, like I said, progressing. We had, what's this, total of 15, uh, 18, you know, vehicles or boats, planes, trespassing over. It's there. It's it's going to be there until one day it happens. And that happens. You better hope you have, you know, like I said, you know, this is a great time to buy stuff. You better hope you have everything you needed, everything you've ordered. Because when China does do that, and I fully believe they will, you don't do all this if you're not going to pull the trigger one day and go after Taiwan. You know, Xi, while he was in San Francisco with Biden, said... It's best for not one of us not to remodel the other. You know, don't go to war, but we can both succeed if we kind of just leave each other alone. Let me let us take Taiwan. You mind your own business. We'll both be fine. Remember, she was saying that. So, uh, when that if that when that happens, 
and those shipping lanes get congested or there's a naval blockade in that area and it's not safe for ships and insurance rates go skyrocketing because of, the, of transporting goods, you better hope you've ordered everything that you need for your survival and your prepping. So like I said, it's a great time during this holiday period. Black Friday sales, other sales, pick on some stuff you need. Something's been too expensive that might be on a great sale. If you see deals on great stuff, post them either you know, on one of my videos in a comment uh, or in, 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 you can respond to your community section where I'll put some stuff. Just share the knowledge, you know, help each other out. So, you know, dollars are tight for everybody. And this might be a good time to pick up the last few things before, well, we can't. So that's all I have for you. Hope you got something out of this. Until next time, keep your ear to the ground and head on a swivel. If it bleeds, we can kill it.